I come to you with such a love today, speaking my word in the name of Jesus Christ that everything that is good and perfect may flow into your life to promote your highest and eternal good. Because I pray from my heart, because I love you as my friend, I believe my prayer is being answered. Infinite multiplying good flows into your life today and will continue to do so through all the days God gives to you in this world and then right on throughout all eternity. That is the value of friendship because friendship in love, in prayer, in spiritual truth bring us together and it is in this togetherness that everything wonderful takes place. Prayer is always the product of love flowing with compassion, which is love in action, flowing with compassion towards people in need and in that fellowship together so are we inspired and guided and helped and blessed and very often tremendous healings take place just through the concept of being one together, loving one another, praying for one another and believing in the miraculous power of Christ in action. Now we are all involved in this healing process everybody because we are all part of each other in the mind of God we live and move and have our being in the very Spirit of God and that is a tremendous miracle in itself and sometimes we should be very wise to stop and stand and stare a while to simplify and to come back to basic truths that we are miracles in our own right that we live in the Spirit of God that wonderful things are in store for us that we work in this world in fellowship with one another preparing ourselves for fellowship with loved ones and friends when we go to heaven and when you stop and stand and stare you can see quite clearly how through the whole process of life from that miraculous day when you were born right up to this moment you have been in contact with people who directly influenced your life for good or ill according to the quality of the interchange according to the quality of the relationship but we have been interwoven in the lives of countless people down all the years we've lived in this world and joyfully there are always those people who have influenced us with tremendous blessing opened out new dimensions of thought new horizons of experience, new awareness of what love really means. And in that kind of fellowship we have been progressed. And since blessings never go only one way, when we've met these various people who have influenced us like that, they too have been blessed by that fellowship. Just like now, I conceive and believe the Lord brought us together and therefore in the love I have for you, as I love you and pray for you right now, I know there is an experience of divine blessing reaching you, but equally a divine blessing flowing from you to me and advancing my life, my work, and seeing to an advancement in every direction. As I'm talking to you, I remember amongst a whole host of people who have been directly influential in my life, Many of you will remember Henry Thomas Hamblin. He was that wonderful saint and mystic who founded the Science of Thought Review so very many years ago. That's the wonderful little magazine now edited by that beautiful soul, Claire Cameron, who took over the work when Henry Thomas Hamblin was taken to heaven. Well, Henry Hamblin he was a marvelous man. He became a very great friend of mine in the very early days. And he was directly instrumental in confirming what I was already believing myself. I remember I'd been struggling along in this ministry of divine healing 30 years ago when nobody really wanted to know, when the going was very difficult and it was almost heresy to mention divine healing. Yet I was working away and seeing wonderful things happen to people as I prayed, as they came to the sanctuary, that very early sanctuary, one room. And sometimes getting weary because 
people in high places would shoot me down. And then one day, the Science of Thought Review came to me from somebody, I don't know from whom, and there I read the words of Henry Thomas Hamblin in this lovely little magazine, The Science of Thought Review, which is published, as you perhaps know, in Chichester, England, Bossom House, Chichester, England. And there was Thomas Hamblin talking straight to my heart. He confirmed everything that I was thinking myself. I had drawn it from within, but it was marvellous to have someone who was a generation ahead of me writing and confirming the same basic simple truths of love and faith and prayer, this concept of being one with God and one with each other, all the marvellous things that we know so well today. He was directly influential in my life in that sense. And we grew together. We had many wonderful years of fellowship together. I used to call on him whenever I was in his area and we would just go into the silence together and just be still in the Lord and we didn't talk very much but his great depth of intuition, of inspiration, his sense of awareness of the presence of God was something that was like a light shining. So we would sit in the silence and I would certainly myself be absolutely renewed in spirit and mind and body and then go about on my occasions on the next meetings wherever they may be. Well, I thought you would be interested because, oh, I suppose it must be 20 years ago, I took a recording from him. I asked him to record for me some of his thoughts. And I think it is probably true to say this is the only recording in existence of Henry Thomas Hamblin's voice, Henry Thomas Hamblin speaking to us. So I thought it would be interesting for you to share this and I am arranging for it to be put onto this tape for you to listen to. It's not a very good recording in the sense of quality because all those years ago equipment was very poor too. But nevertheless, here he is. And this is your friend and mine, now living in heaven, Henry Thomas Hamblin, speaking to you. Restoring the years. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. There is nothing that brings more gratitude and joy to my own heart than the knowledge that God restores to us all that the locust of sin has eaten away from our life. We are familiar with the destructive action of locusts, how they settle on the land, devouring everything edible without exception. So also is it with sin. It blights our life, destroying all its fruitfulness, its beauty, its happiness, and everything that makes this earth existence worth living. It robs, blasts, and destroys, leaving us nothing but desolation and despair. But God in his mercy says, I will restore unto you the years which the locust hath eaten. Glory be. It means something more than the forgiveness of sins. It means nothing less than the restoration of all things, just as though sin had never been. Our sins, blunders and shortcomings in the past may have been followed by such disastrous consequences that we fail to see how things can ever be righted or restored. But while to us it may seem to be impossible, 
yet divine grace is such that it can restore all things. Divine grace does not merely save in the ordinary evangelical sense of the term, but it also restores, heals, and makes whole, just as though sin had never been. It not only restores our own life, but it follows the effect of our each sinful act upon other lives. And to every thought that has winged its way out into the unforgetting ether, overruling, restraining, and turning what but for divine grace would be evil into good. How wonderful is the grace of God. How it fills us with joy and thankfulness when we contemplate it and reflect upon it. It is not God himself, but it is something that proceeds from God. It is a healing, restoring power, the natural result of infinite love, combined with infinite wisdom, of love that will never let us go, of wisdom that has no limit. We who are finite cannot understand that which is infinite. But while we cannot understand the grace of God, we can rejoice in it and find peace and rest and satisfaction. Theoretically, we know that all things must be restored and that there can be no failure in the divine plan that all which God has designed must be fulfilled. But it is one thing to have an intellectual or theoretical belief, and quite another to know and realize in the soul, through revelation and spiritual illumination by the Spirit of Truth himself, the reality of this great and most satisfying truth. Surely there is no greater joy and comfort than this, to realize and reflect upon this most gracious truth that God in his love and mercy restores to us the years that the locusts have eaten, that he makes up all that sin in our life has destroyed. Eons of weeping and repentance could never achieve it, but the healing and restoring grace of God, because it is infinite, accomplishes the impossible. Thanks be, our God is a restoring and healing God, who restores and heals the whole of our life. He makes the wilderness blossom as a rose. It is all of grace, for all good comes from the Lord. But while it is um, entirely the action of God, such action, of course, being always good and beneficent, yet we have to do our part. This beautiful healing process can come into action in our case only as we repent of all our shortcomings. Sin is a falling short of the divine perfection. Because of this falling short or missing the mark, first in desire, then in thought, and lastly in action, our life is filled with disorder. We can reach the, the divine order only as we repent of our falling short and consequent disorder. The effect of repentance, a true and deep sorrow for the shortcomings of the past, together with a turning round towards the good, the beautiful, and the true, is to sever us from the curse of sin. 
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we have already seen, this forgiveness is not merely forgiveness as generally understood, but is a complete healing of our life and restoration of our character. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away and all things become new. How wonderful God is. He not only heals and restores our whole life, but he also transforms our characters and makes us new creatures entirely, so that we are as different from what we were years ago as though we were reborn, which indeed is the case. Yet we still retain our individuality and always will. There is no such thing as losing our individuality like a drop of water in the ocean. No matter how much we may enter into God or universal consciousness, our individuality is never lost. No matter how far we may advance, and the vista is too glorious for words, no matter how we may change, no matter how much we may be transformed into the divine likeness or enter into unity and oneness, our individuality is maintained and preserved. We become universal, yet remain individual. I believe that we shall know our loved ones in the great beyond, and they will know us. Praise be to God. We shall be changed so much for the better that we shall be entirely new creatures, glorified in appearance as well as in character. But we shall know each other, and great will be the joy of reunion and continued fellowship when the mists have rolled away. Let us then get away from all that fetters and binds and let us realize that God is a loving, forgiving, healing and restoring God. That from him proceeds this healing, restoring, renewing power which makes all things new if we will only allow it to do so. <clears throat> Time was when it was thought that God had to be pleaded with and beseeched to have mercy upon us as a special favor. But now we know that our Lord came to bring us to God, to reconcile us to God, and to reveal to us a God of love and infinite mercy and goodness. Now we know that no special favor is required, for God is the all good, the all love, and that his healing, restoring, renewing power operates as soon as ever we fulfill the conditions. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts, his unrighteousness thoughts, and return unto the Lord. Let the wrong thinker forsake his wrong thinking and think in harmony with the divine. Let him think God's thoughts after him, for all good thoughts 
come from the Lord. The world is suffering today from the effect of wrong thought about God. Thousands probably are suffering today from various neuroses and other painful maladies because of the fears and terrors implanted in their minds when quite young. They were shaken over the brink of hell by stern-faced theologians so that the poor things were afraid to go to sleep at night. Today they are suffering hell's torments because of the conflict that such teaching has produced in their subconscious mind. But let them return unto the Lord. Let them turn to the pitying Father, the God of love and compassion. Come unto me, said the Eternal Son, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let them obey this loving invitation, and let them keep out of their mind all suggestions and thoughts of fear and doubt, and they will assuredly find rest, health, and peace. If we think of God in a right way, as a God of blessing and blessedness, instead of as a wrathful, omnipotent being from whom we can never be safe, we find to our joy that God is a God of blessing, and that divine love is behind all life's experiences. Further. If we can feel and realize that we are being carried along on a stream of blessedness to our highest good, we find that it, it is so, and all heaven is on our side. William Law wisely wrote that the only salvation is the life of God in the soul. When we turn to God, raising our thoughts, desires, and aspirations to Him, we become open to receive an influx of divine life and power. It is this life of God in the soul, this inflow of the eternal Word, that changes us completely. It breaks down the old nature and builds up the new, until we become entirely new creatures, although, although our individuality remains. And this divine influx of new life outflows into the external life, so that this becomes changed also. The outward life corresponds largely to the life within. If ours is only a negative goodness that merely refrains from the things which worldly people indulge in, and if it is not a robust positive goodness, the outcome of a robust positive spiritual life of faith in God, then the outward life may be but a poor thing. Religion is only too often a negative thing. It fails to lay hold of God and all the glorious things which he is so anxious to bestow, and the glorious life with which he desires to fill us, and because of this is feeble and poor. But our God is not only a forgiving God, he is also an abundant, satisfying God, who restores to us the years which the locust hath eaten. May it be so in the experience of us all.
Thank you, Henry Thomas Hamlin. I love you. We all love you. How wonderful it would have been could the words of Jesus Christ have been recorded. Great things for the future. I always believe that every experience, in life for that matter, is designed by the Father for our highest good. And sometimes when things are very difficult, we find it quite a problem to believe anything like that. But nevertheless, I really believe that we pass through all those experiences which we need to pass through in order to experience our highest good in the end. I'm always very conscious of the fact that being eternal in our lives, the Father must always be helping us to arrange things so that we learn maximum about the art of living here in this world because he has to think what are we be going to do in a hundred years time and two hundred years time and five hundred years time and it seems to me we can only progress by learning to maximum about life here and this naturally involves us in pains and problems and difficulties as well as in joys and ecstasies it is an interchange between the two things that make life possible Light is known because we are aware of darkness. Happiness presupposes sadness. And all these opposites are part of the structure in which we wield and weld our lives together. So we become aware when we look back with hindsight how important various deep factors in our lives were at that time. I can remember just offhand half a dozen situations in my life when I thought everything was crashing around my ears. And yes, it seemed to be at the time, and yet there came some kind of wonderful rescue which opened the way again, and soon the disaster in its potentials and possibilities uh, came only a matter of experience of the past. Whatever else, and whatever age you or I may be, we have lived thus far and we're still here in this world. We're going to go on to the next one too, but we're still here and somehow we've passed through all these experiences, grave or gay. And I suppose most of us will have learned how sometimes the difficult experiences were those which stretched us, which very often stretched our faith, stretched our love, challenged us in all kinds of ways. And in countless instances when we found a victory in adversity, we discovered that it was very valuable that we went through the experience itself. And it is certainly significant in a ministry like ours how we become aware of these great inner resources that so many people have and how tremendous events take place out of the difficulties. I'm thinking at this moment of um, that beloved soul Dorothy Kern. Now, you, I suppose, will have heard of her. Well, if not, she was a wonderful soul, and she was a very, very sick and dying woman. And she had a miraculous healing. The Lord came to her. From being a wrecked body, she became instantaneously a new body, a new person, in such an outstanding way that doctors and nurses and family and everyone was absolutely astounded at what could not be less than a miracle. It was such a transcendental experience to Dorothy Karen that she was led to establish that wonderful center of divine healing and medical care called Burswood. Burswood is near, um, near, um, wait a minute now, it's Groombridge but it's near Tunbridge Wells in Kent. And it's a marvelous place. I've had services there. A beautiful, beautiful church, a wonderful nursing home. And of course, there are people to pray. The warden, now under the Reverend Canon Peter Spink and the resident chaplain, uh, the Reverend Keith Dennerly. Many people of compassion there to help and heal and bless you. So she founded this 
Center for Divine Healing and Medical Care and became absolutely famous. Her mission was to heal the sick, comfort the sorrowing and give faith to the faithless. And it still goes on. Now she's been in heaven quite a not lot of years now and she was a very good friend of mine in those early days. She would often take the chair at services I was having in the south of England and I visited there and we had a very good rapport, a good relationship and a happiness that we were together working in a divine healing ministry. She at Burswood and me here in Blackpool in the World Healing Crusade. And in those early days it was wonderful to have friendship with other people who thought like we did and so grew many prayer groups and fellowship with ministers and and, and people in many groups and, and, and churches worldwide in our case and of course in hers too so that now they have the Burswood International Fellowship well last month I was very happy to find an old recording I made of Henry Thomas Hamblin and I shared it with you in the March edition of this news tape but right alongside it is also a recording I made many years ago at a meeting in Peterborough in England where she and I were on the same platform and our beloved friend Reverend Cecil Gibbings was in the chair and she told the meeting the miracle of her healing how it came about and what it felt like and what happened so I thought since I got the recording and I don't think there are many recordings of her voice either. Since I got it, I thought perhaps this month you would like to hear what she has to say. And when I remind you that out of such terrible suffering, suffering unto death, arose this beautiful work which still goes on in Burswood in that divine healing center, then you can see something of the significance of Christ's victory in the midst of great dilemmas. So here, beloved friend, with great love and reverence and thanksgiving for past friendship, which in those days influenced my life quite greatly, I share that experience with you. And here she is, Dorothy Karen, now living in heaven, still talking back to you. And in presenting this recording, I can't help but think how marvelous it would have been if tape recorders had been invented when Jesus was on earth and we could still listen to his voice today. Well, here is Dorothy Karen. Well, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, this is an unexpected pleasure and privilege and responsibility. And I must ask you to be patient with me because I am not a speaker and I cannot discourse upon the technicalities and problems of divine healing. But I can tell you a little bit about that I know. Many of you, I expect, have read the little book called The Living Touch, or perhaps Fulfilling, and you will have heard how our Lord Jesus Christ laid his hand upon me and restored me instantaneously to a state of perfect home after five years of hopeless, according to our medical gentleman, illness. Tuberculosis, general tuberculosis, which was pathologically and also by X-ray proved. Now, I have been an invalid for five years, and during that time, everything that medical skill and love and care could do had been done. And I was in extremis. Indeed, the doctors who were attending me said that death would occur at any moment. And as my nurse, mother, friends were watching round my bed waiting for the last little flicker of life to ever away. They saw a great light 
come all round me, and they thought it was Jesus taking me. But instead of that, they saw me raised to a sitting position, and then they saw my eyes open and my lips began to speak. And I said, do you hear? I'm to get up and walk. Whereupon, I put my hand on the light and got out of bed. Every whip heard in the twinkling of an eye. And that, after five years, helped me in believing. Now, there are two significant things about that healing which I should like to draw your attention to for a minute. One was that it was because it was the voice of the living Lord who made that command, get up and walk, that that dying girl was able to do so. Had it been any other voice, nothing would have happened. Nothing at all. The second point was that the servant to whom the Lord spoke knew it was the voice of the Lord and without question obeyed. And so the miracle happened. Now that body, which was in such an emaciated state, bound up in cotton wool, in the next morning was every week a well healthy body now doctors came from all over the world to witness what they called the 20th century miracle they saw the x-ray pictures they read the pathological reports they consulted the doctors who had been in attendance and in the end they came to the conclusion that it was something beyond their ken, that it was a repetition of the raising of Jairus' daughter. Now, I'm not going to try to make any explanation, medical or spiritual, but I tell you, in the presence of God and before the whole company of heaven, that those words and those statements are true. Well, you might ask, why was Dorothy Kelly singled out for this miracle? I wish I could answer that question. It certainly was not because of any merit or deserving of her own, no. It was because it was in the pattern and the will of God to raise her up for his own purpose. And during the years that have followed, we have seen, through the goodness of God, all those miracles in the Bible, all those acts of the apostles, we have seen them repeated. The wonderful works of God are happening in our midst today. They have never ceased to happen, and they will never cease to happen, so long as we have faith and belief in the power of a living, resurrected <coughs> Why is it, can you tell me, that our hospitals are full to overflow, our mental homes full to overflow? You can't get a bed, but if we believe the living power of a living Lord we shouldn't be able to get a, a seat in church. The churches would be crammed to overflow. Now, that is a challenge to everyone here tonight. And for God's sake, go out into this stricken, suffering, tormented world and carry this message to suffering mankind that Jesus lives. Jesus walks among us today, just as he walked along the shores of Galilee, working miracles, 
healing the sick, comforting the sorrowing, giving faith to the faithless, giving hope to the hopeless. My friends, this is true. It is not a lovely bit of mystical history. It is a truth. It is the truth of God. Indeed, I would go so far as to say, in all humility, that if those miracles which our Lord Jesus wrought along the shores of Galilee nearly 2,000 years ago were true, then they are equally true today. And if they cannot happen today, then the whole thing is a myth and a lie. And thank God we know it is true. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Dorothy Caron. I do apologize for the technical quality of the recording, but all those years ago, machines, tape recorders, were not very efficient and it was a bit of a noisy hall. <laughs>